Greetings. This is Steve McKenzie, former longtime member of the Microsoft Visual C++ team. I've been retired for some years, but I've been paying attention. And I have a proposal. Leave no journeyman behind, flattening the C++ learning curve. And what has brought this on? Well, I've been noticing mostly from the lectures at the conferences, C++ conferences, that there's an emphasis. It's been going on for a several years now to get back to basics. That C++ is a huge language now that's constantly churning and so the leaders of C++ are trying to provide a narrow path of best practices with uh, Struce wrote the book A Tour of C++ now on its second edition. There have been lecture series, a back to the basics le lecture series and uh, a website with uh, core C++ guidelines. And of course these are fine. However, the messaging from the leaders is still found lacking, in my opinion. And the gap that separates an expert from a non-expert continues to widen. And so, what am I proposing? Well, first of all, I want to uh, sort of define a problem, problem statement. Uh, before we get to my solution. Uh, and first of all, this presentation presumes that um, the listener of this presentation understands the challenges of the, why C++ has to uh, become more modern, more relevant uh, in this day with um, uh, other programming languages uh, incringing upon the like systems programming domain. Um, but also I want to bring awareness, especially to the C++ leaders, um, uh, I want to challenge their epistemology, meaning their theory of knowledge. Uh, what is someone's highest authority today? You know, today I would argue that traditional credentials do not always overcome a less compelling message. Okay, uh, so we'll touch upon that briefly. Uh, I also believe it's helpful to identify current profiles of programmers that are professional C++ programmers uh, and to identify the distinctives that separate the expert from the non-expert. And now driving more towards my solution, I've been developing what I am coining a uh, vocabulary-driven curriculum from lessons that I've personally learned uh, from learning foreign languages, Greek and Hebrew in particular. And so it's based on this old proverb, my, my principle here, that's on my slide here. Give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. And so the analogy I want to draw here is that, um, you know, providing best practices and guidelines and conferences is like giving a man a fish. It's well intended, but actually it only exacerbates the problem. And, and to me personally, it's kind of patronizing. I want to bring back that principle, that C principle of respecting the programmer, not suspecting the programmer. Conversely, giving a leg up to the non-expert to learn the vocabulary of the expert, to deepen the understanding, to bridge the gap between the non-expert and the expert is like teaching a man how to fish. It leads to more self-sufficiency, making C++ and the ISO standard and new features more approachable. Okay, about the messaging. So first of all, there's a lot of preaching to the choir. I mean, if, you're pre if you are giving a lecture at a C++ conference, that's a friendly audience, but the audience is broader than the thousand people that attend a C++ conference. See, there are diverse opinions about credibility today. I mean, people trust their own judgment if what an expert asserts doesn't ring true to them or is no longer relevant. And what are some examples? So, uh, Peter Summerlad, a frequent speaker at the conferences at BoostCon 2019 in a lecture titled How I Stopped Worrying and Learned to Love C++ Type System. Nice title. He pointed out that C, the C programming language, was developed by experts for experts. Okay. 
sort of saying that you don't have to be an expert to use C++, but we'll leave that aside for now. Uh, Strustrup and Gregory have issued outright imperatives to stop teaching C and have asserted that C is obsolete. Now, the way I understand that is they are asserting that under no circumstance whatsoever is the C programming language appropriate. <laughs> but the problem with that argument is why stop there? I mean, the Rust community would agree with you. Yeah, stop teaching C, but they would say stop teaching C++ as well. <laughs> In other words, the Rust community would say, hey, replace being really careful with these best practices and, and use a language that actually enforces best practices. The computer's a lot better than the human element. It's a compelling point. And by the way, Rust is coming on. I think they were like the 34th most popular programming language. I think they're in the 20s now, and I think they're going to make it. I think they're doing well. But, but the point of this slide, though, really is that using your credentials at a conference as sort of a bully pulpit, it's rhetoric. And it's rhetoric that's relevant to presuppositions that are on the way out, that are waning. It betrays a monopolistic attitude that's sort of a throwback to the 90s. You know, just plain and simple, it's preaching. It's p political rhetoric, posturing. You know, I, I took exception to it. Um, and look, I'm not a... I'm a big C++ fan, okay? But I gave, I pushed back on this. I gave a well-received talk at the 2018 Linux Fest Northwest called YC, Refuting C++ Pretentiousness. And it pushed back on this bully pulpit rhetoric. And it was uh, well-received by uh, some of the members of the Visual C++ team in the audience. Um, Mark Goodner was there, for example. Uh, you know, I'm not ashamed of C. You know, you know the way that the C++, the leaders of the C++ community are acting like kind of like spoiled brat heirs who've inherited this embarrassment of riches that want to disown their parents. You know, instead of disowning C, my attitude is I embrace the noble legacy of the C programming language. Don't want to disown it. I'm proud of it. And I think you should be too. Okay, let's switch gears a little bit. So I'm using this term journeyman or non-expert. Uh, look, you, most who are listening to this presentation, you know the profiles. You know, I mean, myself is a great profile. I mean, when I first started at Microsoft, the Microsoft Foundation class library was very popular. It, In fact, it's still the only, I, I think it is, I've... It's the desktop application framework for Windows. And you just run a wizard and make some selections. And you have a running Windows C++ desktop application. And uh, when I very first started at Microsoft, I was in Visual C++ support. And uh, many programmers use the Microsoft Foundation class library without really understanding much of the core language. Um, and, you know, during that time and even today, I think that people are, engineers are hired uh, due to good problem-solving skills, uh, and the language isn't, doesn't really matter. They're hired in a language ag agnostic, agnostic manner. Um, so the, I think there's a lot of professional C++ programmers that have learned enough C++ to get by. They've picked up things along the way, and they're getting better, uh, but they are still not expert. Uh, then there's the embedded realm, which is getting more ubiquitous. Uh, dominated by scientists and electrical engineers. And, you know, an electrical engineer has to deal with a 2,000-page manual of a microcontroller. You know, they, they're not chomping at the bit to tackle a 1,500-page modern C++ specification. And, you know, C is well-established in their domain. Their programs are relatively simplistic. In mission-critical systems, there's no dynamic memory allocation, so memory safety is not so much an issue. Really, it's all about reading and writing to memory map device registers and handling interrupts from external devices, you know, at most a handful. And there's well-established solutions to implementing simple context switching to handle, prioritize, and often nested interrupts and so on. And if they use C++, it's 9803. Modern C++ is not compelling to them. And then there's others that just may have been discouraged or they're just tired of having to keep up worth having to rapidly uh, 
keep up with a rapidly churning language and having to rebuild their code every few years when the ABI breaks. You know, rather than keep up, they, they might consider some of these other languages. So I think that some of the leaders in the committee are waking up to some of these gaps that the uh, non-experts have. Um, you know, one of the talks at CPVCon 2019 was by uh, Chandler Carruth and um, oh, Winters, the other guy from Google. Uh, what was it called? What is C++ was the name of the talk. And um, they were a bit taken back that um, many programmers don't understand copying, let alone R-value references. You know, not everyone took a compiler class. Not everyone has a computer science degree even. Uh, and so it's difficult for some of these journeymen to keep up with the new features because they're not well grounded in the basic building blocks of C++. They really don't speak the language of the expert. They know bits and pieces. They can parrot back some of the linguistics, but they lack the rich vocabulary and deeper understanding. Now, perhaps the leaders in the C++ community don't care about these who meet these profiles. But I think they should. They should care. Because converting these journeymen to experts increase the odds that legacy code bases will be incrementally refactored to keep up with the latest advances. Expert distinctives. So the experts grasp the competitive need for modern C++. They understand why C++ has to move in the direction that it is moving in. One thing that helped me um, that deepen my understanding of this is that I've been learning the Rust programming language a bit, and it's helped me to understand the direction of modern C++. Is the need for a more memory-safe, ownership-aware, statistically, uh, statically uh, resolved, and more functional programming language. Uh, another distinctive that experts have is they're very familiar with templates. And our solution addresses this. Experts are familiar with the compiler, you know, setting up stack frames for function calls and familiar with, you know, how many copies would occur in this scenario and moves and return value optimization, uh, optimizations and so on. Um, also, experts are able to comprehend the ISO standard, speak the language of the standard. Um, it's more intuitive, this sort of recursive descent flow of the grammar. Uh, experts are familiar with operating systems and, and uh, computer systems, thread scheduling, context switches, virtual memory, concurrency and parallelism, and so on. Uh, experts are familiar with modern hardware, you know, the processor, the staged pipeline of the pro processor, uh, out of order execution, the impact of memory locality and the cache system, cache coherency, and so on. And then Experts make use of tools like the Online Compiler Explorer and are comfortable with looking at disassembly and, you know, for things like inspecting that const expert objects actually decompose to a simple move instruction instead of a call or a jump. Uh, there are comfortable tools like dump bin or OBJ dump to inspect opcodes and addresses and mnemonics and note memory fence mitigations like for Spectre and so on and are... Uh, know how to refer to the Intel, AMD, or ARM manuals to look at opcodes and mnemonics and instructions. Uh, these are what I feel are the um, distinctives of an expert. Okay, give a man a fish, like I was making my case. Hey, there's nothing wrong with back to basics. I mean, it, you have to have it. You have to have this back to basic and best practices, okay? by all means, continue to define that safe path. But, you know, it's easy to stray, right? Very easy to stray. Let's say that you're writing a program and you're parsing some text and you want to break that text up into tokens. And so it's pretty easy to use C++ to open a file and loop through the file using a file stream and using string to get line and, and all of that. And so you have a string with a line and now you want to parts and into tokens. Well, stir toke is much easier than crafting up a 
regular expression pattern and using regular regular expression pattern iterators. I mean, it's not intuitive uh, as Sturtok is. Uh, so people will jump to that solution if they can't figure out the um, the C++ way. I mean, I, I think that is a weakness in uh, the string class that we don't have a standard split like in Python or Perl and so on. I mean, Boost has a split, but again, um, it's not as intuitive to Sturtok, and Sturtok does have a reentrant form, st Sturtok underscore R, but, uh, and so, and by the way, I don't think there's anything wrong with using Sturtok <laughs> in a simple scenario. And so it's easy to just fall back on C. Uh, but at the same time, unless you know what you're doing and you stray off that path, well, there you go. You can stray off the path easily. So you have to do more than give a man a fish. You have to teach a man to fish. You know, let's build up non-experts to become experts. Stop patronizing them. And I feel patronized by a lot of it. Stop disowning C. As I said before, embrace the noble legacy of C. We have an embarrassment of riches. Stop suspecting the programmer. You know, instead, bring back that C core principle of respect the programmer. And not only C, but C++ is also for experts. Because of what I just said in the previous slide about falling back to Sturtok, you have to know what you're doing with C++. You can't, these best practices and everything are great, but the Rust community makes a great point. You're relying on the human element uh, that people are going to keep the training wheels on and they can easily stray off the path. And so you cannot, um, it's not reasonable to expect non-experts to uh, stay on that narrow path. You have to create experts so that they know what they're doing and so that these best practices are intuitive, that they don't have to just do a, memorize a bunch of laws so they're not just law keeping, being, you know, you're being dependent on a, the C++ nanny state, right? And so what am I proposing? So again, back to the uh, some of the techniques I use to learn natural language, oriental languages, a vocabulary-driven curriculum is what I'm ca calling it. Uh, there's this electronic flashcard platform called Anki, and I'm using it as an organizing principle. I've created about 100 flashcards already. It's helping me. Uh, now, there's no substitute for book study and watching videos, and so it's to reinforce that. It's to reinforce and help retain the book study and video lectures and to keep it fresh. It's to keep it fresh so you can go through a uh, 1,000 slides pretty quickly, and you, it will help keep that information fresh especially when you're at my age, you know, it's, and it's not necessarily to memorize, but to familiarize, to uh, know where things, you're going to get to know where things are in the standard, where things are in the references, and to uh, become immersed in the language. And the goal is to make, one of the goals is to make the ISO standard approachable. It's to help crack the code, you know, to enable continued self-study. It's to learn the secret handshake of the experts. But, the thing about it, though, it's not just a secret handshake. It's a lot of work, and it's there's no silver bullet, but it's a way to offer a way to bridge the gap from non-expert to expert, giving a leg up to that non-expert, that journeyman that wants to take on the challenge. So it's based off of the book study. So a very important book is C++ Template, second edition, uh, the entire part one. So uh, I intend, you know, so the idea is to make um, flashcards uh, from study notes out of part one, and then I'm halfway completed flashcards on the glossary, which is the best glossary out of all the resources that I have found, and then study notes from the C programming language, fourth edition, part two. Now, you notice there's no modern C++ here because this premise is based on the fact that what's prohibiting the journeyman from reaching expertise level is a grasp of the basic building blocks, the core language features 
uh, that are not necessarily related to modern C++ yet. You're going to get a lot of the modern C++ from the C++ templates. Uh, but this course focuses on the grammar, the low-level uh, vocabulary of C++, a compiler-level vocabulary. Uh, C programming language, there's a, a recursive descent parser for complex declarations uh, that uh, maybe it's not a, um, there's no flashcards out of it, but it might just be a, um, a video. And then from the ISO standard, um, focusing on clause 6 through 9, Appendix A, the grammar uh, summary, and an index of grammar production. So this is the, the reading assignments, more or less. And then the flashcards. So again, uh, the glossary and study notes from part one of C++ uh, template second edition, uh, study notes of the C++ programming language. Um, I'm just repeating myself here, so I won't. So the format of the flashcards, and I'll have a demo here at the end of my talk. Well, it's a traditional flashcard for one thing. It's question and answer, you know, front and back, although it's electronic, so it's uh, it can fill up your whole screen, so they can be quite large. You can fill in the blanks because this Anki uh, flashcard platform supports typing in answers if you want to get that pedantic. Uh, some of the flashcards might just be explanatory only, you know, because there are some things that you cannot break down into question and answer. You might just want to take a paragraph from the standard or a page from the standard and expand it in a flashcard and have an audio that explains it. And so you and you can use audio in any of the flashcards so that you can have both um, visual and uh, audio uh, sensory uh, immersion to help uh, retain the knowledge, to help grasp the knowledge. And, and another great thing about this um, flashcard uh, platform is that each flashcard can be rated. You can rate it easy, hard, and you can schedule it. You know, do you want to, is this one too easy? You know, don't visit it for a long time, or do you need to keep looking at it until you get it? So you can s schedule the frequency that the flashcard is going to be um, uh, shown, and you can rate them easy, hard, difficult, and so on. And also, um, the platform uh, has an interface for editing the flashcards can be edited by users and the uh, um, the content can be stored as text. Um, it's in a format of a, a LaTeX uh, web base stored in a database eventually, but it can be stored as text, exported and imported, and it can be kept under source control. So it can be an open, open source project uh, collaboration if, if that's appropriate. Okay, so here's some links to some papers. Um, I have a more um, verbose rationale uh, for this in uh, a paper form, uh, Leave No Journeyman Behind, Flattening the Seatbelt Learning Curve. And then I have a, um, a syllabus. Um, so I'll bring this over here. I don't know if you can see this. Let me make it bigger. So again, um, you can look at the standard and see this, but it's all listed out here. Um, but, you know, just like I say, it's the core building blocks, You're learning the grammar, learning the low level vocabulary of C++, learning the core principles. I mean, the idea is that maybe you didn't take a compiler class, but when you be, become familiar with this grammar and what's going on, I mean, you can't understand R values if you don't understand L values. You need to be able to think in terms of expressions and statements. You need to take a look at a line of C++ code and see, oh, there's an expression. Oh, there's an L value. There's a temporary value. It becomes intuitive. You see it. You see um, what the compiler is doing more. Uh, so that's that one. Let's see. I don't want to want to get this one over here uh, and so look I won't open up any of the others there's then there's other possibilities for other um, uh, courseware on arm assembly and the reason I um, choosing arm assembly is for those who perhaps don't have a strong understanding of operating systems it helped me a lot 
to program a microcontroller to uh, write and assembly the context switches and to handle the interrupts and so on to understand uh, uh, the two different stacks, one in, you could say, kernel mode or in protected mode and one not and so on. And um, uh, memory mapped uh, registers and so on. And the startup, you know, how the processor jumps to an address and you're initializing the hardware, you're uh, configuring a clock and everything is clock driven. And so you gives you more of a uh, more of an understanding of how a, a operating system scheduling works and so on. Um, and then uh, x86, x64 assembly, so that uh, mostly so that you can um, understand disassembly better and uh, object file tools like OBJ dump and so on. And then a, a Rust competitive analysis, learning Rust, and, and actually. Uh, looking into the uh, port that's happening. Um, you know, Rust is um, a brainchild of the Mozilla, um, who developed uh, Firefox and part, I think the web assembly parts of that browser are being rewritten in, in Rust from C++ to Rust. And so it'd be interesting to see if um, the things that are being changed to Rust, how, what's a better way to, what would it look like to use C++ in a better way? I've taken a look and the code looks pretty clean. I'm not sure there's any low-hanging fruit there, but there's some competitive analysis there. Also, the idea of, um, as an exercise, to maybe develop a Clang plugin uh, or use uh, filters for an existing tool like Clang Tidy that might enforce the Rust uh, borrow, borrower um, uh, paradigm uh, and maybe write some samples like using curly brace scoping and smart pointers to sort of um, emulate it in C++. It's, it, the patterns aren't clean. Rust does a, uh, Rust is developed for it, but you can, um, it would prove the point that anything you can do in Rust, you can do with C++. And then I have this other stretch goal of, um, you know, that book by Stefanov, um, uh, elements of programming, you know, that is very mathematical and philosophical, uh, but really it's, um, it borrows from the Platonic forms, right? And so you have like forms in heaven of a divine essence and <laughs> stamping out instances of concrete, uh, concrete instances of sort of um, uh, this melding of programming, mathematics, and uh, philosophy. But you know, that's, again, that's a stretch. Okay, and so here's my credits. Um, these books. And by the way, I one thing that, uh, before I get to the demo, um, there are some next steps, like uh, how would this be delivered? And um, I'm concerned about uh, mitigating any copyright concerns. I mean, I'm typing in things from published books. Uh, I don't know if the standard is probably copyrighted. And so um, these are things that would need to be smoothed out. Okay, so let's get to the uh, flashcard demo. So I'll close this down. And... Okay, so make this a little bigger. This is the user interface, and I've made five decks. Now you could make just one deck and filter on uh, the tags, but um, we'll go. We'll start with C++ templates and uh, study now. What is a template ID? Now notice I have this um, uh, format of in italicizing the dash names, which I'm calling. Um, Standard keywords. You know, they're not C++ keywords so much, but they're standard keywords. You're going to find uh, these words in the um, index of grammar productions and so on. And so um, it says show the answer. And so it gives the answer here. I, tr I try to color code it. And notice down here at the bottom, you can rate it. You can say do it again in less than one minute, uh, do it again in less than 10 minutes, or put it off for four days. And there's more. You can filter. Um, you can suspend a card. You can play. Like I say, you can put audio into these cards. 
uh, you can record your voice right here and there and make and create the audio right here uh, while you're reviewing the decks and so on. So this platform has a lot of versatility. There's a lot of things that we can do uh, with it. Um, and then also, I'm going to click here, Browse. Now this is sort of the development view. And so here in the left we have our decks and um, here we have our cards and you can edit the cards and see down here at the bottom we have a tag chapter evil uh, chapter equal gram dot key and so um, I'm not sure that um, uh, I might want to present some of these grammar constructs all at once and turn it into an audio presentation of presenting the grammar construct, but for now I have it in this flashcard um, uh, format. Uh, let's go to the templates. And so, um, you know, what's the difference between a template parameter and a template argument and so on? Um, uh, what's a constant expression? What does decay mean? What's an alias template? Uh, what is a complete type? What is a concept? Define a declaration and so on. I mean, just um, this is a great glossary from the uh, C++ template second edition. But anyway, getting into a lot of detail here, but you get the, I think you get the gist. Um, I'm kind of fired up about this. Uh, I'm hoping that I can drum up some interest. Um, and if so, uh, I'd be happy to lead the project in some form or another. Like I said, there's uh, a lot of questions remain to be answered in terms of how it would be delivered, whether it's an open source project, whether someone would sponsor it or whatever. Uh, but I'm open to any conversations. And if you're listening to this, I'd be happy to hear your thoughts on it. And so that's all for now. And thanks for your attention.